Jo espero que aquest panell sigui revelador per molts de vosaltres, que veieu la profunditat amb la qual s'aborda aquesta complexitat i començarem amb la primera ponència. La primera ponència la presentaran venen des de l'Ajuntament de Liverpool. Al Niall Johnson li hem demanat que ens expliqui una mica el que estan fent i que d'alguna manera puguem enlluernar-nos sobre la manera d'abordar el problema amb la seva veritable magnitud i no amb l'urgència que a vegades els mediterranis tenim tendència a produir. Niall, per si us plau. Good morning. I'm the Energy Company Obligations Framework Manager for Liverpool City Council. I'll briefly talk about the UK's policy and stock condition survey stuff, and then I'll move into Liverpool itself. So I'll talk about housing first. There are approximately 23 million households in England. 64% of those are in owner-occupier hands. Uh, with the rest in private rented sector, roughly 50-50 between uh, social housing, which is local authority or social provider-led. Um, the average age of a first-time buyer in the UK is currently 33. Um, I know this well because I'm 36 and I've only just built my first house because of the house prices. 63% um, of social renters or people in the private rented sector receive housing benefits, uh, which is state aid basically to help pay for their rent because uh, the rent prices are quite high. Um, of the stock in owner-occupier hands, 92% of those are houses, whereas in the private rented sector, that's only 63%, so the rest's made up of flats, bungalows, uh, masonettes, that kind of thing. 33% uh, of the housing stock is pre-1919 in the private rented sector, so old houses. Um, and in the social sector, which is local authority, um, it's post-1945 built. So um, in the private rented sector, the housing is likely to be more old and have more inefficiencies and problems, really. Sorry, I should have had that slide up. Uh, so this is from the housing, English Housing Survey, and that's just basically what I've just covered. So the government has a standard assessment process that they use to measure the energy efficiency in homes. Um, it's an index-based calculation uh, based on annual space heating and water, uh, and it's basically from the uh, EC Directive 2002-92. Uh, it's the same kind of system, so you've probably seen a nice uh, G rating up to A++++, whatever it is now. Um, the average SAP rating of an English dwelling is actually 61, which puts that at band D. Uh, that's risen uh, from 45 in 1996. I'm a little bit dubious about these results. When I look at the data, I'm like, really? Um, but that's, that's the government statistics that we have, really. Um, the thoughts around the energy efficiency improving is thought to be due to condensing boilers were made mandatory for retrofit, or if you had a new boiler, it had to be a condensing boiler, and that's from roughly mid-2000s. Uh, so that's why we've had a big increase. <coughs> So, tackling fuel poverty. Uh, this is the fuel poverty strategy from the UK, or part of it anyway, which shows a typical English household versus a poor household. Uh, it tells you who they are, uh, who are the fuel poor, what you're likely to be, and so forth. Um, so, over one million house Households in the UK are considered to be fuel poor or energy poor. Uh, fuel poverty in the UK is it's not new. There was an act of parliament in 1811 that provided a charity for the fuel poor. That charity still exists today, so over 200 years, and we've still not solved this problem. Uh, the new system uses a low-income, high-cost calculator. 
uh, for the fuel poor, it's based on income below the poverty line uh, and a higher than typical energy cost. Uh, what they use is um, predicted energy bills rather than actual energy bills because some people underheat their properties because they can't afford it. So if you just based fuel poverty on their actual spend, you're not going to capture what really the real situation. So we base it on the property itself and what it should cost to heat that property based on um, insulation, double glazing, boilers type, uh, fuel type they use and so on. Um, so basically an average person in a band D property would spend around a thousand pounds more, which is 1200 euros more than somebody in the average category range. So it's, it's a lot. Um, the strategy sets out a milestone that by 2018, everyone must meet. If you rent a property to a resident, it's got to be a minimum band E. By 2025, it's got to be a band D. By 2030, it's got to be an EPC band C. Otherwise, you can't rent that property out. Um, it's a little bit different for if you're an owner-occupier. Um, there's not that much help available, I'm afraid. Um, the energy company obligations that I work on is estimated to put in about a billion pounds in up till 2017 to improve properties. So the Liverpool programme, how do we tackle this? Well, it's a major concern. So Liverpool is the little splodge just there, soon to be Liverpool City region, which will come like all this area. So it's roughly six authorities are coming together under a, a, a much larger mayoral system. So it used to be, then we split up, then it's come back together. Um, it's a, an award-winning program. Previously, we've won Fuel Poverty Awards. We've won uh, Customer Service Excellent Awards, Decade of Elf 2020 Awards, because it's a cross cutting approach. We don't just look at fuel poverty. We look at housing conditions and health. So the program's funded by public health. Uh, it sits in public protection. It's delivered by staff in community services. We have 16 signatory partners that we uh, have a data sharing protocol with so we can refer out and receive data in with no problems because everyone's controller of that data. We refer to 40 different partners based on whether the client says yes you can refer to X or no uh, and it's a range of issues from plugging elderly into community groups to maximizing income to so on you know I could talk forever on this um, the, the Liverpool Healthy Homes acts as a central hub so we take inbound calls from people on a free phone number we'll take inbound referrals from healthcare professionals uh, charities whoever uh, but we also have an advocacy service, so using a set of data, we go out to a particular area based on levels of health deprivation, levels of fuel poverty, uh, educational attainment. We tackle it by going out and door knocking and finding these people and doing a survey on their property and looking at their health and then make sure that the correct referrals get, get made. Uh, so fuel poverty, like I said, it's part of the commissioning drivers for the Healthy Homes Program. Uh, it's written into the service level agreement from public health. We have to deliver against that. Um, it's one of the five mayoral priorities in the city. It's also in the housing strategy, so it's cross-departmental, and we try to come together and work on things like this. Uh, we also work with National Energy Action, which is a charity doing a community action partnership where we take fuel advice, debt advice, um, and energy efficiency advice out to the communities. Um, so I'll skip over this slide because it's just, I ain't got time. Uh, the main thing I want to say about this slide is there's a 10 year difference in some boroughs in Liverpool between the poor sections and the more affluent sections. So if we look at Picton and Church, for example, Church is probably one of the most affluent areas in Liverpool, whereas Picton, it's not. 
the housing stock's different, education's attainment's lower, uh, fuel poverty's much higher. So it's, and it's different against the national average as well. People can die at least you know, 10, 10 years earlier. Um, anyway, so the program set out to identify 25,000 properties uh, in neighborhoods that required uh, intervention, housing and health intervention. Uh, it, we assess the needs of the people through an assessment form which looks at their health, their housing conditions and their energy efficiency levels within their property. Uh, as mentioned previously, we do this through public engagement. We actually go out and find these people in the community because not everybody in the community is very mobile. Not everyone in the community will seek support that they need from the national government. So. And because we're commissioned by health service, we carry the health service logo, which enables us to get better access into people's property. Otherwise, if you just go with the council logo on, they're like, ooh, uh, are they after taking my benefits? Have I, you know, I, some you know, fraudulent benefit claim to happen. So sometimes they're very mistrustful of the government itself, but because we carry the health badge of the NHS, you get more, you get through people's doors more. Um, the target was to actually inspect with environmental health officers 4,400 properties to remove category one, uh, category one hazards. These are life-threatening conditions. So there is, if I just move on, I'll talk about the category, uh, category has one hazards later on. Um, so if I talk more about Liverpool, there's half a million people in Liverpool. There's 148,000 private sector properties. Uh, approximately 13% of these pose a health and safety risk that's category one, so threatened to life. Um, approximately 13% fail the decent home standard, which is a government policy. Uh, they have to have bathrooms, clean water, certain heating levels, certain levels of insulation. Um, that's a requirement by law for rented properties. Um, Fuel poverty is estimated to affect around 30,000 households in Liverpool. It's approximately 14%. Um, and 7.5% of properties in Liverpool do not have a central heating system. Uh, that might not seem that unusual to warm climates, but in the UK, if you've not got a central heating system, it's quite cold. Uh, I live in a listed property that's got electric panel heating. It's got sash windows, single pane glass, and I'm going to show you it. In winter it's cold. Um, but not all the listed buildings, some people just never had heating systems. When we're out in the community, we sometimes find uh, Mrs. Smith, she's 92, she's never had hot water in her property, she's never had a central heating system, she's got single glazing, uh, she may live downstairs in her property, and without going out into these communities, we don't find these people. Uh, they've never claimed benefits. They're, they're, they're not really known. They're self-sufficient. They rely on themselves. Um, they live off their pension. So some people live in really large houses, but they're living in one room and they're unknown to society. So this, this is what the program does. Um, in the Indices of Multiple Deprivation, which looks at education, fuel poverty, health, uh, employment, and so on, uh, Liverpool was the worst in England. Um, we can see that from the central section. Uh, and if we look at the distribution of rented housing and health deprivation itself, you can see that the fuel poverty areas, the indices of multiple deprivation, the social housing and the private rented sector all align. So the private rented sector is the most important to tackle because the social sector and the government run properties meet these standards already, so we have to tackle the private rented sector. So we use a, a targeted approach using a Health Homes Index. That's, we use approximately 14 indicators. Uh, that, there's no way I can show you the indicators here, but at the end of the presentation, there's a link. And in that link, that's a, a nice case study, which is uh, National Institute of Care and Clinical Excellence, something like that. Um, and that has the 14 indicators on. So if you want to have a look at what we use to 
target and prioritize which area of the city we go into first because it's priority based. Uh, you'd be able to find that from that. Uh, it's based on lower superhour areas and there are 291 lower superhour output areas which makes us one of the worst uh, cities, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, energy efficiency and fuel poverty, fuel cost, household incomes are all important. And one of the key elements that we use is a housing health and safety rating system, which is a calculated system used by our environmental health officers. So once we've identified a property with advocates, if, if the advocate thinks there's uh, an issue in that property, we'll send an environmental health officer out to that property and they'll conduct a, a full survey. And if it m meets a category one hazard, they will enforce a notice on the landlord to improve that property. So as you can see here, this is from the start of the program, 2009 to 2016, we've identified and removed over 1,400 excess cold cases. So that's properties that, you know, it's inexplicably linked with fuel poverty. So these homes are cold, uh, inefficient heating systems, uh, lack of double glazing, lack of insulation. Um, but the main ones, and they can all be quite linked together. Damp and mold is a cause is caused by cold in a lot of instances uh, and falls on stairs. If your property is cold, you've seen you may have warmed one room up and you leave that room to go to the toilet, your blood thickens uh, and you may you know might get dizzy, you might fall down the stairs. So they're linked as well, different falls. Um, we use a cost cutting approach, like I said earlier. We, we don't just go out to the property and then say to the landlord, here's a notice, you must improve that property, otherwise we'll take you to court and then you'll pay to have the property improved and you'll pay a fine as well. What we have to do for the client is we plug them into housing, health and welfare benefits as well. Do they need a referral to a doctor? Do they need referrals to social services? Do they need disabled facilities access grants into their property? Um, do they need income maximisation? Are they, are they entitled to government state aid and they're not aware of? So we make sure we plug all these in at the same time. So it's, it, it's an important element of the programme. I'll skip across this slide, but what's mainly important here is the winter survival campaigns. We have a big launch and we give energy efficiency advice uh, we do competitions, we give out energy efficiency appliance, like kettles, eco kettles and so on. Uh, but we also go into community centers, we go into faith groups, and through the winter we will tell people how to keep warm in their property. Um, but our, that also gives us, once again, another in to talking to people about their properties. We can do our survey, or a, a reduced version of our survey, in the community centres and arrange a visit to that property and once again plug people in that wouldn't normally come to us. We, we go and seek people to help these people out. Um, next slide. We have a Switch Together Safe Together campaign run by the Liverpool City Region, so that's six local authorities and a charity. Uh, people register with us to switch their energy suppliers. Uh, what we do then is we negotiate a tariff based on a collective buying power because there are hundreds to thousands of people who sign up for this each year and we've saved quite a lot of money. So it's roughly, you save about a quarter of people's energy bill by being able to negotiate a collective tariff so that can reduce fuel poverty. Liverpool City Council itself is looking at setting up its own energy company. That's so we can, once again, it's a much bigger buying power. We can. We're looking, rather than producing our own electricity, which is what some councils do, like Nottingham City Council have their own energy company. So what we'd actually do is we'd buy our energy from that local council. We'd set our tariffs for the fuel pool. People are on prepayment meters. We've, we still install thousands of prepayment meters while the energy companies do. So we're looking at trying to remove that element and reduce the costs, because it's something like 25% extra if you're on a prepayment meter, it's, it's ridiculous. So the fuel poor suffer more 
because they fall into debts and so on. Uh, we have outreach programs. So initially, the, we tried to set up a working with the GPs that are using their, their systems, their patient systems. So if they have a particular health condition, it'd flag up on the doctor's system and they'd then ask questions about their home. Is it cold? Is it damp? Could that be affecting your health? Um, unfortunately, that required too much of the GP's time. The doctors didn't like it because just about everybody popped up on the screen in Liverpool. Uh, as having a problem. So what we do now is we regularly visit 39, uh, which is almost half of the GP surgeries across the city, and we sit in the waiting rooms and we talk to the patients. Is your home cold? Is it damp? Uh, could it be affecting your health? So we try and remove health inequalities and cold. Same again, we fill out a form, we arrange visits, we go out to the property, we do assessments, and we remove the hazards that way. Um, We currently have uh, many energy partners. So we deliver eco and first time full central heating systems for free for people that qualify for certain benefits. Uh, there's always stipulations. It's generally the most poor people that get access to these kind of uh, reduced or of, of free uh, services. Uh, Foundations is a home improvement um, agency. We've now just become a home improvement agency ourselves. So we've got access to more charitable grants uh, we're accredited. Uh, National Energy Action paid for eight energy efficiency advisors, so they're fully qualified to offer energy advice. Uh, the energy company obligations sector that work as a framework with us is the, the bottom ones here. They work on strategic area-based projects, so we'll look at tenure, we'll look at deprivation, We'll go into those areas, specifically looking for people who would qualify for free boilers, free heating. So, you know, we target numerous ways. Um, Brividis is a group of 16 social providers and six local authorities. And once again, we run different campaigns through that section. Uh, Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, I've been working on housing strategy papers related to housing and health. I've worked on papers for the health section because national government's going to devolve the powers and the spending powers to Liverpool and the, the city region. So we'll, we'll be able to decide where we spend the money on health. So are we going to put it into removing coal? Are we going to put it into transport? And so we get more decision powers. Uh, so progress so far. So we've done a lot of inspections. We reached our target of 25,000. With 22,000 referrals to health and wellbeing partners alone. Uh, there's been over 6,000 environmental health inspections that have removed category one hazards. Uh, there's been 4,500 uh, people have benefited from energy efficiency advice, fuel poverty, and maximizing their income, which all affects whether or not you suffer from energy or fuel poverty. Um, we also provide budgeting planning as well. We don't just write off people's debt. So if we come across somebody, so for example, recently we've had a client that had 11,000 pounds worth of debt, uh, 12,500 euros maybe, something like that. Um, we spoke to the energy company for a trust fund. They wrote that debt off. We then provided a debt plan so that person would no longer get into debt on their fuel poverty. We made sure that they had a energy efficient boiler, they were on the right tariffs, uh, so that, that's how we, we can help people. Um, so as the category one hazards have been removed, there's been five and a half million pounds worth of private sector investment. Now that's just for category one, uh, we don't measure for category two, so there's, it's an underestimation how much has been spent, but also we don't measure how much voluntary money gets spent by the landlords. So that's kind of key probably going forward. We should probably measure how much charitable in income we generate into the city, how much benefit maximization we get, how much, 
how much we get, we really should. But there's been over 3,000 referrals to social providers. So Liverpool transferred their housing stock into the public, into social landlords. So they're not-for-profit organisations that's supposed to... They're supposed to meet the decent owned standard. So we've, we've referred 3,000 cases back to themselves saying, your property does not meet the standard. Improve it now. And we'll give them 28 days to improve the property. If not, we get them, we call them in and go, it's not acceptable. We'll take you to court, improve your property. So it's kind of a, sometimes a softly, softly approach. It's more, we'll speak to you first because it costs money to take people through courts. So evaluation, um, there's lots to be done, but we've increased, we've improved our indices of multiple deprivation ranking from being the worst to the fourth worst, which might not sound like a lot, but there's, that's an improvement. We've improved the fuel poverty by 4%. There's 4% less fuel poverty in Liverpool since the programme started. Um, we've got a long way to go, but the programme works as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've got a wealth of data, so actually you can probably barely see it, but this is the form underneath that we use. So it's actually three pages and then a uh, equalities form, making sure that we're capturing a good broad swathe of the population and we're not just tackling Mrs. Smith who's 65. And so we, we, we make sure that we're, we're cross-cutting across all sections. Uh, we tackle pe things legally as well. Um, we've had landlords that we've taken to court, we've asked them to improve the energy efficiency of their property because it's too expensive. Uh, we've gone to court and the court said, no, the cost of a property is not material in a case for excess cold. Uh, the council disagreed with that assessment, so we took it to a higher court and the higher court decided that actually, yes, the cost of a prop of energy for a property depending on the heating system is material uh, and therefore that sets a legal precedent now so every landlord has to be mindful that their property needs to be cost effective for the client and that's that's key that's basically going to go all the way across the UK that's been reported nationally in the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health so that's it's now a tool that we can use in leveraging better income um, and it also, it's another tool that saves us having to go to court. We can say, you have to do this because of this. So it's just one of those things, really. Um, so, by, so you may have seen some of these slides before because I worked with Ian Watson. So some of the slides that I've used were his. Uh, we had Bree do an independent report, which is the building research establishment. And the simple answer was yes. So the program's estimated to save 55 million pounds over its lifetime. Uh, 42 million of that is for excess cold removal, which is massive. Now this system's based on the estimated cost savings to the health service by removal of the 29 category one hazards that we've identified, which I showed the graph of earlier. Um, I believe this value is grossly underestimated once again to the value for the program because we don't measure how much charitable income, we don't measure how much uh, income maximization, we don't measure the voluntary improvements that happen to people's property. So going forward, we should really tackle that uh, and add that into our evaluation models because our budget's been cut by half, even though we've proven that we save money. Um, but that's austerity for you. And because we're getting caught, we're now going to work with, uh, yeah, I'm just about done, actually. <laughs> we're going to work with the hospitals, respiratory centres, fracture clinics, uh, cardiovascular clinics, because all these health conditions are affected more by fuel poverty. And because we're getting a limited amount of funding, we're going to have to retarget our resources. Um, thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.